Hello, welcome to Stirring to the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach, back here for a brand new year in 2023. With me, as always, is Matt Brandenburg. Happy New Year! We made it! And Vitla Bay Mist. I <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people are going to be like, so what the fuck did she just say? Yeah. Did she, like, did, did she okay, wish us a happy new year or did she just tell us to go fuck ourselves? Did you say a slur? Is it a slur? Did you say a slur? <laughs> you, you decide, listener. Yeah. <laughs> Magic just, eight ball. You know, just, just Google Translate it. <laughs> Yeah, we'll 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 put like I'll slow that section of the audio way down so everyone can hear it. <laughs> you can phonetically tape it into Google Translate and see what it says. Mm, yes, and then you'll and then you'll hear this is how it's pronounced, not how it's pronounced in God of War Ragnarok. <laughs> <laughs> if you can not tell, I'm a little bit bitter about that, but that, that's that, that's in a whole other episode. <laughs> that game is bad fun though. It's a super fun, but it's messing so much with Norse mythology. It's making me mad. Imagine how the Greeks felt with the with the original God of War games. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Like anyone who is super into mythology, like I am, they they would have been pissed. This is not like their kind of game. <laughs> I see. It and, as more and, it's, and, and, and it's not only like you know here they also like try to make an effort with the Icelandic words, and I'm like. Well, you get a B for effort. <laughs> nice. You get you get an F for pronunciation. Like you did no studying. <laughs> you just came to the exam and says, fuck it, I'll just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's cool. I just want to beat people up. It's all good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, today's episode is gonna be on the not so funny and very serious story. We the girls who did not make it by EA. Uh, Petra Cone, I think is how you pronounce her name. You can read the story on nightmaremagazine.com and uh, have have tissues. It's it's mm-hmm. a it's a it's a pretty heavy one. Yeah. So we're, we're bringing yeah. we're bringing an abyss at at a, at a happy happy new year right. with a with a really depressing story. I think it's fitting for what we do. Indeed, and <laughs> just know, how the world is coming to is just super fitting. Right. It's yeah. it's. It's very dreary here, so it, it's that weird January month of, like, just depression, so this totally works. hmm <laughs> Totally. But, but don't I, worry, we'll, we'll get, we'll go with a super happy fuck, fucked up story next week. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> uh, no, I would We I need a, we need a pallid cleanser every now and yeah. then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to find something funny for us next week. But, uh, before we dive into to this uh, horror story, we should go into some of the media we recommended happy things over the last couple weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, which my first thing I'm going to start off with isn't so happy, but I think it's worth watching. And unfortunately, there's some rights issues, so it's only available in North America, HBO Max right now. But um, it's called This Place Rules. It is a, it's a documentary. So there's a there's a guy who I've been watching on YouTube for a while. His name's Andrew Callahan. He used to have a channel called All Gas No Breaks, that was stolen from him. He made a second channel called Channel Five with Andrew Callahan, and he lives in an RV with his two best friends, and they drive around the country just going to places and doing man on the street interviews. Okay, and like. And he does things like he'll like he'll go to Burning Man or he'll be like, oh, shit, it's Daytona. Let's go to Daytona. And he'll just like be there and kind of capture what's going on. And while he was doing his thing, which his videos are pretty funny. While he was doing his thing, he was he was going to lots of like MAGA rallies, lots of Trump rallies to record the people and talk with the people. And he noticed they were getting like more and more antagonistic the closer it got to election season. So he wanted to just turn this into a documentary with his ideas like, I just want to see where this is going to go. And it ended up being him going from MAGA rally to MAGA rally, leading up to what would happen on January 6th. Jeez. And he's just like, and it's like, there's a lot of comedy in it to offset the seriousness because he's a funny guy. But like, it does get pretty, pretty serious. 
I've been watching his content for years. I know like his, what he feels like politically. Politically, he's on the very kind of left side of things. But when he's doing his like interview stuff, he does what he does what he can to remain as neutral as possible because he wants people to like tell their own story and even dig their own graves if they're kind of that far that far gone, you know? Yeah. And so that's kind of like there's one part where he is interviewing a guy throughout the documentary who makes all these videos on BitChute, which is like an off-brand YouTube that a lot of like extreme right wing people post videos on. And he's doing all these bit shoot videos about like demonic cabals raping children, eating babies. Oh my god. And then, and then the end yeah, then, and then the end, he meets up with him again at at a restaurant. And they're talking, and he's talking about how like uh, Donald Trump was the outsider and he wasn't a pedophile and blah 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 blah. And all these people in office are demonic pedophiles. And then he holds up a picture of um he pulls up a picture of a politician and the guy's like pedophile. Then he holds up a picture of Hillary Clinton and the guy's like pedophile. Then he holds up a picture of Joe Biden and the guy's like, I call him Chomo Joe. And he's like, What's Chomo mean? The guy's like, it's a jailhouse term for pedophile. And then he holds up a picture of Jonah Hill, who produced the movie, and he goes, Oh yeah, he's a pedophile. <laughs> and then and then he pulls out a paperwork and he goes, This is documentation from this date in 1999 where you were arrested for sexual assault to a minor. <laughs> Dang. And then he's like, Do you have anything to say about this? And the guy's like, It was a false conviction. And he's like, Have you heard the term projection before? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And his idea is like this person's taken his shame of his crime he's did and he's projected it onto this whole other thing that is then influencing lots of other people in a negative way. And that's kind of like what he's trying to do in this documentary is show like these these people who we aren't really facing the blame towards, who are the ones that are doing the most harm. Like how Alex Jones came out of the Census City Hook thing got fucked on that. But Alex Jones came out of the whole January 6th thing unharmed, which he's in the documentary, too. They turned him into a clown in, in the documentary. There's a scene in the documentary where he's drinking whiskey and, be- and bench pressing with Alex Jones. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it's like one of the most surreal things I've ever seen. Um, it's it's a trip. It's It's a good documentary, but it does get into some pretty heavy topics as it goes. And a uh, spoiler alert, I will say... His his kind of thesis is that the the in his perspective, the me like the mainstream American media, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, those are the people who end up pushing regular Americans into more extreme ideologies, which weren't helped with social media just being super strict on people, pushing people off platforms into further strict echo chambers. And then it created monsters. Hmm. And he's just like, this is this is kind of what's going on. And like these people made a profit off of like causing mental harm to like billions of Americans. Yeah, um, sounds heavy. He also, he also goes to a family that's fully been indoctrinated by QAnon, which uh, you see little kids doing QAnon talking points. Oh which God. I think you'd be child abuse on the on the, the term of the parents. <laughs> but onto onto a serious topic and moving to a second serious topic. And H Matt and I was talking about this with you earlier. HBO Max has released I shouldn't say released, has been hosting Strange Days, directed by Catherine Bigelow, which is one of the most underrated 90s sci-fi action movies ever made. More of a, more of a sci-fi mystery movie. Yeah. But it's so fucking good. Like, I watched it 20 years ago, and I kind of went into it again with barely remembering anything from it, and it's still just utterly captivating. And I wish we had more media releases of this. I do think it's crazy that it has taken this long. Like, everything that's been put out in Blu-ray and DVD and streamed on every million streaming channel, it's like... Why this movie was a big like it was a big movie like I remember the trailers and the posters and seeing it at the theater so like it wasn't some underground hidden thing it was a thing. 
I think a lot of people didn't want to revisit it because it deals with like police brutality, like the Rodney King riots were a clear influence on, on this movie. Yeah. Um. So I mean, I I think just because of socio political stuff in the movie, and also it bombed in theaters apparently. Yeah, I kind of remember it not like I remember it being at theaters, but I also remember it not being like. I thing. honestly do not remember this movie. I don't think it. I don't even think it went on theaters here. <laughs> it probably didn't, honestly. Um, it is so. All, all I'll say is, this is '90s Catherine Bigelow. So Catherine Bigelow in her prime. Yep. Um, with a and it's sp- written by James written by Cameron. James Cameron, which is like James Cameron's just just what James Cameron does. Um. <laughs> Sometimes, honestly, he's written some great movies. Yeah. Like, hands down. The, the, dude, the dude has ideas. Um, and it's just a really solid sci-fi mystery noir movie. That, mm-hmm. like, it's it, it's really intense, but it's really fucking good. Yeah. It's got, what, a young Ray Fiennes in it. It does have a mm-hmm. young Ray Fiennes in it. And <laughs> Ashel, Angela Bassett. She's, yeah. <laughs> she's awesome. So. Yeah, no, it is it is a fantastic cast. I think Michael Ironside's in it too. <laughs> oh, Michael Ironside. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tom Sizemore, isn't it? Yes. Ooh, Tom Sizemore, yeah. Yes. Like it's got a it's got a stacked cast. Like I don't know why this movie's been kind of forgotten. Like it's weird, you know? Yeah. It, it feels like it's said to be a cult classic. Oh, if we just had the media releases. <laughs> but besides that, I really haven't been doing much. I'm still reading um, Smithy by the, the chimpanzee book I mentioned last. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Which, uh, it's super fucking creepy. Um, <laughs> epistolary novels are so hard to do well, and this is done really well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just the whole idea of let's teach a chimpanzee sign language and now it's communicating to things we can't see and strange things are happening. <laughs> That's such a great concept. <laughs> I know. I can imagine this probably would have also been like cool adaptation, like into a film. Yes. Yeah, honestly, it could be. Like the, I will say so far the book is is great. It is a really great paranormal horror novel. But like it is it is definitely creepy. Like under your gets under your skin creepy. That's good. That is awesome. So, I will definitely say once once I finish it, I will let us know how it is. But this is definitely a really great read. But uh, Matt, what about you? Yes. All right. So I let's see where to begin. Um, because it feels like it's been a while. Uh, I think the first thing which oh, wait, pause. I... Do, do we do, have we all seen the Glass Onion? Yes. Yes. Okay, we can we can we can talk about the Glass Onion when it gets to Vit Lebay then. All right, mm-hmm. perfect. Because, yeah, I literally just watched that two days ago. Yeah. I so. watched it yesterday. So. Did you? <laughs> I watched it the day it came out. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we'll talk that soon. Um, I think first thing is I read Carl Edward Wagner's In a Lonely Place, which is coming out from, was that, Valencourt uh, put yeah. it out. And I think they're... Since I pre-ordered it, I got it early, but I think it's officially July, January 16th or something. So anyway, it's one of these collections that people have been talking about forever, hope, wishing and wishing it could come out. You know, I think we've covered two of his stories in the past, and it is one of those things, even when we were covering them, we're like, oh, we want to read more, we want to read more. And so it's luckily we got this collection from Valencourt, and it is exactly what everyone's talking about. It's such a good collection of stories, and it makes me sad that it's taken this long to get out. So, you know, we've covered Sticks. That is sort of the unofficial basis for Blair Witch Project, so I'm not going to go into too many details on that one, except that it was really great to read it again. We did another one of the stories, but I can't remember right now. I might it was something with the river, like... Um... It was one. Of, it was one about the um, soldier who comes across a family of cannibals. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm just. That's what I was just looking at the book right now to see if I remember which one it was. But 
Yeah, that was a good one. But anyway, like the whole everything in here is just the like his the way he describes setting and the way he sets up this like sense of dread with the just settings and um like emotion and everything like that is so great. A lot of these stories you'll find because like this. I think this is early 80s. Um, I guess I could look again. I'm literally holding this in my hand. But <laughs> I think this came out like technically early 80s and stuff like that. So you get a little bit of, yeah, 1983. So you do get a little bit of that kind of older style where it's like it's this really slow build up and then there's like something crazy that happens kind of at the end. But everything in here is just this depressing <laughs> kind of like world that everyone lives in it, it i like the title is just perfect because it is everything is this, this lonely thing so there's like a uh, story about this um like lawyer who gets kind of he, he gets in a car or his wife gets in a car accident and then he's got to kind of take care of her and he kind of loses his business because he's putting all of his time to her and so they move to this little cabin out in the middle of the woods in this small kind of vacation community and there's a painting in one of these lower levels and he becomes obsessed with it and then you start getting these slow reveal that other people who've stayed at this cabin have become obsessed with this woman that's into painting and and she slowly starts kind of killing them and that so like it's you know so kind of a basic concept you get obsessed with a painting and then there's like a ghost but like just the way he does it in this story you just feel trapped in this cabin and in fact they uh ramsey campbell does the intro to this and he mentions that story specifically and he's like oh you know it fits a lot with um the shining probably specifically stanley kubrick's the shining where this lawyer is hanging out with himself at a bar that's in this cabin and is getting drunker and drunker and obsessed with this picture and starts like really hating his wife and everything like that. And, and again, I'd have to double check when that story was published just to kind of figure out who, who did it first, if Stephen King or if Carl Ed Wagner did this kind of concept first, but that idea is there. Um, there's another story about these kind of, this artist and his girlfriend and they're sort of hippie and they hang out at this like antique house thing, this house that sells like antiques and you slowly start realizing that there is like something living in all these weeds that are taking over all the lots. Again, his descriptions and his <laughs> depressing descriptions of neighborhoods and this neighborhood is just falling apart and being taken over by weeds and vines and it slowly re reveals that there's something actually is living in these weeds. I don't want to give it away because it is kind of like a what the hell moment. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. But it, it, I, people need to read this. It's, it's so good. And it's such a bummer. Like, cause he died from, um, I think again, I would have to look it up. I'm holding the book, but I don't feel like looking it up, but he died in 94 due to alcoholism and stuff like that. And, and, and it does come across in here, which is kind of sad is like, if you kind of knowing his history and reading these stories, they're all very, that kind of depressed look at the world. And, and you can kind of get an idea of like where his mind was in all of this, but it's very good. Highly recommend picking it up. I think we're going to talk about it at some point on the show. So I won't go any more details than that, but I am so happy Valencourt put this out is definitely worth a read if you're if you look at any you know if we look at levels of horror writers and you kind of look at the old guard today there's the brian Keynes and there's you know ramsey campbell and all these all of these authors who kind of are the older guard and they might not like hearing that but like you know they're not recently new people they all yeah. really tout carl Ed edward wagner and it totally makes sense so definitely check that out the other collection I read and finished was Orrin Gray's uh, How to See Ghosts and Other Figments. This is from Word Horde, and it came out, I think, just 
late last year. So it's his newest collection. I think he's got four collections out and this one actually, and even mentions it. It's, it's his widest, uh, date of publication of stories. So there's stuff in here from like 2009 all the way up to 2021. So it's a wow. wide birth of his stuff. And he's just like, hits my sweet spot on stories. I, if, I have we've covered have we covered an Orrin Gray story? I don't think we have. Uh, we, we have a while ago. Okay. Oh, yes, we did that one with the rest stop. Wasn't that the yeah. one? That's what we did. Yep. Okay. Well, it's not in this one, but uh, so we've we've covered him before. But he uh, he's got a, a very awesome style. Uh, if you've listened to the show before, you know how I like Jonathan Rab, and Jonathan Rab does a lot of the like movie kind of look at and like weird conspiracy theories. Well, Oren Gray does a lot of the kind of looking at old B movies and he really likes horror attractions. And that's what this, all of these stories, there's 18 stories in here and they're all kind of touch on those concepts of old Hollywood horror and old um, amusement park things. So there's like a a story in here where there's a kind of, uh, oh my gosh, why, uh, um, uh, why it starts with the name, Ray, Ray Harryhausen type of character. So there's like a person here that makes miniatures and makes these awesome masks and, and costumes for old, old fifties and sixties kind of horror movies while it's set now. And he calls a group of his friends and they come to this beat up mall and he's got this, crazy attraction set in there and he's figured out a way to make the monsters real. So it's like, you know, stuff like that. Or there's a annotated look at an old hammer movie about this like metal man that can just kill everything. And he kind of has author notes in there um, in the story. So not real author notes, but about like what's happening. And, and that one I think actually was in, um, Gosh, there was a Giallo horror anthology that came out maybe two years ago, and it's that was in that one. And then there's like a video game kind of horror story in here that was in Jonathan Rabb's um, Horror in 16 Bits. And this one... Oh, that was anthology. Yeah, it's the anthology. Yep, yep. So that was, that was a really good one. And so there's a story in here with that. So it's just he touches on a little bit of everything. It's all always just a little weird off center look at these kind of attractions and haunted houses and stuff like that. And it's just so good. It's one of those things where you like he, and we talk about this a lot. There's, he's an author that more people need to know. I think he's got such a unique style and such a unique look and his worlds are fantastical in these kind of weird horror movie ways that I've been saying. So like he just, it's, it, it's a fun kind of look and there, there are some really like deeper looks. So like the video game stories about this arcade game in this like old arcade and the game is kind of like a ghosts and goblins kind of thing. So it's a, you know, old kind of beat up game but like what you're finding out as you read through it is our narrator of the story his wife had committed suicide and so he's kind of dealing with this suicide while he's playing the game and because i've learned and the nice learned with reading collections is look for the author notes and orin gray does a really nice thing and word horde does a really nice thing where they put the author notes after each story so i don't have to go digging all the way in the back and trying to find it <laughs> <laughs> and and Oren Gray reveals that he has also dealt with these kind of situations. So like with the, the, the suicide situations and stuff like that. So, you know, like uh, as much as it is fantastical as you're reading these stories and you're like, Oh, cool. It's just look at a weird haunted attraction that's in the middle of a neighborhood. And there's all these weird things that happen in it. He he's also kind of touching on some more um, deeper subjects too. So he's kind of blending the both, but like, it's still just a fun kind of wacky world that we're looking at with his stuff. So it, I, we've touted it word horde forever. I'm going to tout them again. I'm so happy they put this out. It's a great, great collection 
Uh, <laughs> Silvia Moreno Garcia does the introduction, which is super cool considering where she's at and everything. So it's just awesome to be like her taking the time to highlight how great Orin Gray is. So if you're looking for a little bit of weird stuff and you like short stories, this is definitely a good way to go. Um, yeah. You can't go wrong with Orin Gray. Like his stuff's really great. Yeah, I you know it. I it he he hits that thing that I like all these weird things, and I'm like, this is this is the magic I want. So <laughs> it's super good. Um, that I think that's the main thing. I'm almost done with Jonathan Mayberry's um, Kagan the Damned, which is his kind of fantasy sort of sorcery. I have Kagan the Damned. I'm actually buying the sequel uh, next week. I need to do it. I'm like less than a hundred pages away from being Isn't done with Kagan it. Sick. Like it's a pretty sick book. It's yeah. Really it's, sick. it's awesome. I, you know, and I feel like we've talked something similar about this and I was like, Oh, you know, I'd really like a fantasy horror novel that deals with kind of otherworldly things. And, and he does <laughs> in this <laughs> one, you got all of the Lovecraft mythos. You got King and yellow mythos. You got, vampires in here you got werewolves in here but it's still a very set in a kind of game fantasy of thrones-esque world, world. <clears throat> yeah mm, fantasy like fantasy world, so. yeah so yeah. no modern weapons it's just i need to i need a sword with this no swords don't work on this thing <laughs> <laughs> exactly and it's it, it i am interested to see where it goes uh because yes the sequel is coming out and i'm sure i feel like there's gonna be more and, and he does it's hint a at it's a trilogy. Okay, sweet. And there is there is a short story you can buy on Amazon that links novel one and novel two together. Oh, I did not know that. Okay, I'll have to look at that. But it's yeah. But anyway, I'm not done with it, so we don't need to talk any more about it. I'm just, it's pretty good. If that's if you're if you like fantasy sword and sorcery stuff and you like horror stuff, this one is right up there for you. I like how the first 100 pages is him waking up naked, hungover, and figuring out what the fuck is going on while everyone's <laughs> around him. Yes. You know, it's so funny that you bring that up because I was looking at reviews and somebody was complaining about that. <laughs> they were like, God, the first 20 freaking chapters are all one night. I don't understand. And I'm like, what is what? That's a weird complaint. But OK, you know, everyone has their everyone has their opinion. <laughs> But uh, LeMay, what about you? Mm, I haven't been reading as much. Well, I did finish, though, like my first read of 2023. Uh, I got, I got, well, I got one book from my brother for Christmas that I kind of wasn't really into. So I went to the store and just exchanged it. And I got, uh, I got the latest of Junji Ito's. Oh, oh, I got no, I already have that. This is the black box paradox. Oh, it's, it's a it's a manga he put up back in 2002, but was never translated to English until just now. Yes. Nice. And this is, in my opinion, this is one of his best stories. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, I know you talk. I know you guys talked about that. You thought uh, Liminal Zones was like had one of the like had a lot of great stories, but th this is just a com just one complete story, and it's really good. Yeah. It's Check it's it about yeah, it's about these like four four people who meet uh, like they all met under like a kind of like a suicide ideation forum called the Black Box. And they all want to go together and commit suicide. Huh. A great premise, by the way. Yeah. But, but uh, it was still intriguing. So like, okay. And they all go to this place. And for some reason, they start like to doubt each other. Like they're not like they think that neither of them is going to go through with it. <laughs> and like, or just one does it and the other, and they just leave the other behind or something like that. Um, and then... Something happens to one person, like it's, it's like he dies, but but then they notice like this is wrong, like this is not the same person that they talk to. Like there's a lot of weird shit happening, and it's usually like this one person who is a nurse is kind of like you can She, I would say that she probably is like the main character, but like we we all get 
like viewed in the, all the all the other four, all, all the other three. And she, but she is the one who kind of has this feeling that not everything is what it seems. She kind of gets like she can sense this sense this type of thing, and they all try, like when the first suicide attempt fails, they try again, and then they discover kind of like a realm into the afterlife, oh. and. From it, they find like a like a big jewel that is kind of like a sphere, and from there, like they could be all, like most of them, except for the other girl, they become obsessed with it, and it has this like otherworldly things. Like they had like there's this theories about this being souls trapped inside, but um, if you hang on to it, you like you get this kind of like this glow, or you kind of like become more happier or you find a purpose in life or something like that and it just all kind of just goes out of hand and it goes into like this science fiction like it dips its toe into science fiction horror and then it just goes beyond that and then it goes into horrifying body horror <laughs> I mean, Junji, Junji is so good at doing it, like drawing body horror I just love it <laughs> And uh, yeah, and it just ends in kind of like um, can't say like it's like it was hope inspiring, but like it ends kind of vaguely, which I love. This is what Junji really kind of does best: is leaving ambiguous endings. <laughs> and yeah, I can't. I like I don't want to spoil too much about the story, but this was really good. And uh, like like I said, the art is really good. The story is cohesive, even though like like I said, it went in all different directions. But it's still like it managed to connect everything together, and you got some answers and like some questions answered, but some were still left, which is kind of typical with you know Japanese horror. Yeah, like Japanese horror is all about the ambiguity. Yeah. So yeah, so I was really really impressed. I really liked it. <laughs> and I don't uh, I haven't read it yet. What? So I haven't read that one yet, but I'll have to check it out soon. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, like I said, I definitely recommend it. Like, I now, I think I have all of, all of Junji's collection now. Nice. Yeah. Except for the one that he illustrated that is after um, that is after Tasai. Like, the no longer human one. I need to check that one out, too. But he didn't but write that I story. Also, uh, Tasai the... wrote that, and uh, Junji illustrated it. Hmm. Out of the, oh, well, Junji, Junji's design adaptations also written by uh, Ito. Um, yeah, it's yeah. There, there's there's parts that are taken out of the novel, and there's a lot of stuff that Ito added and made for his own adaptation. Yeah, um, there's actually another manga adaptation of The Longer Human that's way better than Ito's. Huh. Oh, okay. I yeah, forget I who did it, but if you look up um, No Longer Human, the mm -hmm. manga that did Ito's is a thousand times better than Ito's adaptation. <laughs> Yes. Ina's adaptation is good, but this one is, like, fantastic. Nice. All right. Oh, yeah. Th this one, I... Well, there's another story that I also want to recommend, and I uh, highly, like, people should check it out. Uh, I did finish it, though, before the... Uh, before the... Before 2020... Uh, 2022 ended. Um, and it's called The Loss of the Skies. Hmm. I was about to start that book once I finish the... Um, <laughs> what I'm reading now. I hear it's super fucked up. It is... So fucked up. Okay, so, uh, um, so I had to, when I when I was in high school, I we had to read Lord of the Flies, like William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Yeah, and yep. and I I think I was the only one in class that absolutely loved that fucking story. <laughs> because, probably because of my depraved mind, I was like, yeah, kids. Turning on each other and trying to kill each other on an uh, like on an abandoned island. That's amazing. <laughs> um, so that's it, it is actually one of my favorite stories. So <laughs> so when I heard like I think I saw it on TikTok or something. When when I heard that someone compared this story, the Lost of the Skies, to um, Lord of the Flies, I was like, oh okay, then it's, that's definitely going to be my jam. And it's <laughs> and it was shorter, so it's like a novella. I I listened I listened to the audiobook so I think it was about 4 hours or something like that. 
And that book is so fucked up. That trauma, <laughs> this, this, I thought, like, I mean, if you think, if you people thought that, you know, Lord of the Flies would traumatize you with all the child deaths, you will not be prepared for a lot of these guys. <laughs> Wait, who wrote it? I, it's a French, ah, it, it's a French author, yeah. It was okay. trans, yeah, I can't remember the, his name. That's all right. I'll look it up. I have it up on my, um, it is, uh, Gregory Court Toys. That's French. Um, Let me see if I can pronounce it. Gregor (laughs) Couture. I'll put it in the show notes. Everyone can look it up. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, it it was translated. It was uh, it was written, I think, in 2019, I believe. Uh, Or if it or 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 if it was yeah yeah, it was. I think it was translated in 2019. Yeah, it's translated at least the, 19, uh, yeah, at least, French in 2016. Yeah, at least the audiobook thing, I think, said something similar to that. I recommend listening to the audiobook because the person who is narrating it is like an old man. I can't remember his name, but he does it really well. Like, I kind of imagined like Charles Dance reading <laughs> it for me, <laughs> which fell, felt all the more fucked up. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> but, but still quite impressive. So I was like, ooh, this is horrifying. He's, say, he's like telling the, ch- the deaths of those children with such finesse. <laughs> it's horrifying. I hear, I hear this book has a lot of child death. All the child deaths, Rich. <laughs> like the book, the ch- like on, on the first fucking sentence, this guy says, oh, by the way, none of them survive. <laughs> Nice. And, I'll, and just like the beginning of the story, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and, and you know, if you remember from Lord of the Fry, Flies, the kids are like maybe, what, 10 to 12 years old or something like yeah. that? Yeah. These children are six. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Jesus Christ. They are six years old. And um, do you, have you guys, have you, you probably guys have read The Troop by Nick Cutter, right? Yeah. No. Okay, there's this there's this kid in the troop that is just all kinds of fucked up, <laughs> and I believe that Nick Cutter read Lost of the Skies, saw the kid Enzo in it, and he's like, "Huh, well, I got my inspiration here." <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so because, are you saying Nick because, Cutter has a time machine? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I mean, I, that wouldn't surprise me. I was he wrote deep. came out first. That's why I was like, oh, he is top <laughs> machine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, or, or maybe Gregor um, read the troop and he's like, oh, I got my inspiration there. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, and so is a fucked up kick for a six year old. He's just all kinds of nasty and it's just like, you just you I like I said I was listening to this audiobook while I was taking my walks and there were times that I had to like stop walking and be like are you fucking shitting me? <laughs> he said what? <laughs> and uh, and it's just like everything like it was basically Murphy's law like anything will go wrong to these children like wow. nothing good comes to them. That's and, amazing. And and not only just the children like all the adults. They die too. Jeez. In the most horrific ways. And I'm like, what's happening here? This is supposed to be like a weekend camping trip with these children. <laughs> and they all insane. die. And like the guy goes into horrifying descriptions into one death scene. <laughs> I, well, I won't. I won't. I won't spoil which death scene. But you actually go like he breaks the fourth wall sometimes in in the story, uh-huh. and then he kind of shifts the point of view. And in this death scene, you are in the point of view of the guy who was being killed. Wow, wow, and it is absolutely horrifying. It's it was nauseating. I think I think I might need to need to put this immediately after I finish Smithy. I think I think you need to. Like I said, it was. Yeah. Also, he has he has a new English translation coming out in the 18th of this month. The author who wrote Laws of the Skies. Oh, it, I'm 
is he a hor- like is it a new horror book or like I don't I'm no, like it, I kind of had the I kind of had the feeling like this guy is not like a typical horror author. It sounds pretty fucked up. Um, it's called The Agents. And the part description is 1984 meets Tron via the office in this bloody dystopian, in this boldly dystopian novel. Huh. huh. And it says here, the agents don't know what they're agents of, but they're very busy agenting, which means <laughs> lots of endless data feeds in their cubicles, cubicles that are piled on one on top of another in a massive tower in which the agents both live and work. Empty floor service battlefields where different kind where different guilds of agents fight for territory. It seems like defenestration is the only way out of the ballot of, of the, the ballot of suicides. It is here we meet Theodore, who has amputated his own toes and must maintain a thirty degree angle to keep his balance, and Solvig, who is pregnant though agents don't usually have sex, as well as the artist Laszlo and self mutilating Clara, and there's Hick. The new agent who seems strangely happy and occupies a cubicle that is strategically strategically important. The battle for key territory is heating up and the agents aren't sure which of them will make it out alive. If needed, that's what any of them want. Okay, this got my attention immediately. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean I kind of figured like if he was gonna like if more of his work is gonna be translated, I will definitely be re- reading it because like I said, this one traumatized me. It's like, like usually nothing fades me. Like I, I, well, when it comes to like in stream horror, I can I can get squeamish, of course. Like who doesn't? Uh, but you know, yeah. But like children's death, I just like, ugh, especially when they go into graphic detail, it's horrifying. Like <laughs> animal and children death, like mm, I might draw the line. But like because everyone was talking about it, like on TikTok, I was like, I can't, and I kind of have to read this book. And then I read it, and I'm like. I, I'm happy I read it, but it traumatized me so. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's like mission accomplished, I guess. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. So yeah, like I can't, like I said, it's, it it just happens within like this story happens within two days. Uh, you kind of like you are you get into the point of views of many characters, almost everyone, uh, including the the adults, um, and. Uh, you kind of like there like there's one adult that you like you kind of like oh fuck you man you're a shitty asshole <laughs> uh, but you and, but at the same time with the others you you feel so bad for them like oh man you guys didn't deserve this shit <laughs> especially with the kids like oh yeah but like I said I'm not gonna go into details you guys need to you need to read it and um, go into the trauma with me. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Well, I, I will Children's dive, death. I will, I will dive into this trouble with you. Yes, yes, please do. <laughs> um, but going forth in film wise, I because Rich kept telling me that Glass Onion was so great, and I can't and I kept remembering that I haven't seen I haven't even seen the first one. You never saw Vibes Out. No. Oh, but I, is- but I have, but I watched it. <laughs> I watched it this week. Okay, good. And I loved it. Yeah, it was such a great film. I this is like one of the. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. I'm kicking myself for not having watched it in 2019. Like, why? Why didn't I? <laughs> I think it was because they didn't advertise it as much in Iceland. Like when it was in the movies, like you, I barely saw like a, a trailer for it. Yeah. I love his his like accent, his yes. foghorn leghorn like yes. Sense. I I love it. It's it's perfect. yeah. It's so funny because the only thing, the only thing I knew about this movie was that Chris Evans was in it. I was like, oh yeah, Chris Evans in it. That's I mean, I love Chris Evans. Why not? And then <laughs> and then I saw the multitude of cast like Jamie Lee Curtis and Michael Shannon, and I was like, what the fuck? Why are there so many yeah. big car- like actors here? And they all play these eclectic characters, and I'm like, oh my lord, this is basically Agatha Christie film in modern times. I yeah. love it. <laughs> yep. And then he, Daniel Craig, shows up, and I was like, is this the new Craig? Oh, huh, interesting. And then when he spoke, I'm like, oh my lord, he's speaking in Southern? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not even a real southern accent. It's like a super I, exaggerated I, southern I accent. Know. And I was like, okay, like, you know, English people are pretty good at, you know, making accents. Like, yeah. I mean, people were tricked into thinking Hugh Laurie was an American for so long. <laughs> so when I when I heard him, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. And he kind of like he like I said, this is like an Agatha Christie novel, and he is basically Poirot. Yeah. yeah. And I love that because it's it's a kind of like a Poirot who doesn't really take himself so seriously. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I have these like quirks and things but you know i'm not the the greatest detective in the world <laughs> <laughs> because you saw that he's like you are um, kind of incompetent a little bit yes <laughs> especially when he was like sitting in the car and just singing yeah. when all the, when all the yeah. ambulances came and i was like dude what the fuck <laughs> oh, <that's> so amazing <laughs> And I just love the execution. I love the mystery. Uh, this is why I love murder mysteries because we always like have these weird ass theories going around as we're watching it. Yes. And I almost was correct with mine, <laughs> which I was like, "Yeah, I know my shit." <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, so we watched the last onion yesterday, and I really liked it. It's not it's not as great as Knives Out, of course. But yeah. still, still, one of the times it was. Yeah. But it was really entertaining. Yeah. I, I, I love seeing him walk around just amazed at like all the wealth I, technology stuff. Yes. <laughs> and also and also just looking at it and, and, and sharing our like the viewers feeling of how pretentious this was. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. When he was just looking around and seeing all the glass, and he's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and I just, and I, I don't know if you guys noticed it, but when, when my husband and I were watching it and Edward Norton came on, and I was like, is he delivering Chandler? Uh, Chandler? No. I, <laughs> I just saw, I just saw Chandler. The entire time he was <laughs> acting, like I just saw Chandler, but like a rich douchey Chandler, and I'm like, "Thank you for almost ruining my favorite friend's character, you asshole." I also love how like both this movie and Knives Out are both kind of like eat the rich like movies, where it's yes. like these incompetent people, like all all the good people are like the working class people or immigrant people in these movies. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I, this is yeah. I think this is why I really liked it. Especially the end, like in Glass Onion, because I I was kind of unsure like how they were gonna wrap it up with what what happened at the climax, but then when yeah. he's just said like I hope you get some courage, and then I was yeah. like what what do you mean? And then it's like oh <laughs> go balls to the walls crazy? That's yeah. just my jam. <laughs> I so uh, yeah I really enjoyed it. I wish the reveal that they do halfway through if they, I wish they would have pushed that to the end but yeah otherwise yeah yeah I, I actually yeah i agree with that yeah i agree with that too it just felt kind of because like it, it was a lot of fun seeing her mm -hmm. smash all this stuff and everything but at the same time you're kind of like well is this how we're ending it and even like with the big bang of an ending you're still kind of like you know you, even with knives out like you have the big reveal and every like it, that ending felt a little bit more satisfying than this one, mm -hmm. but yeah. you know, I, I do love his Ray, uh, Ryan Johnson's just the, like the way he does a mystery where <laughs> like you think it's going to be a one mission. It's always like a layered mystery and, and just yeah. It, yeah. the way he kind of does it. And I get the reveal in the middle because again, he's kind of playing with the tropes of the big end, but um I did, I did like the the fact that Edward Norton just was an idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, was, that cracked me up. Um, did I like you the, guys, did you guys know who did the voice who who did boom? I in the oh, that was, that was support, love it. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, and also the 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 weird uh, drug guy <laughs> that always popped up was uh yeah was the guy from nice from nice Out, who was the the investigator. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yep. He's, in that, he's in every Ryan Johnson movie. I know. I think they're buddies. It's they kind of like a, I, th- I think it's like a Adam Sandler thing. Yeah. I, I loved at the end when like Daniel Craig just lit up one of his cigars. And you see the guy just lit up and join next to him, and he's like, "Hey!" Yeah, he's like, yep. "Fucking a!" <laughs> yep. <laughs> just that whole I, character was hilarious. Did you did you also notice the Ethan Hawke cameo? Yes. <laughs> I, I it was, was like just... it was so funny. We were like, "Is that Ethan Hawke?" And did then, you notice? The... And then nothing. Yeah. Was he playing himself? The... No, no, he yeah. was like he was filming in Budapest, and uh, he just decided to drop in and play a cameo here in the movie. Well, but like just the way they were having Ever Norton drop all these names, and then even having Serena Williams just sitting there. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering, like, is he Ethan Hawke in the movie as Ethan Hawke? I don't no. think so. He's, no, he's not the name of the movie. He just he sprays the ball with that thing. Right? Yeah, take off their mask. But I just I wasn't sure because, again, he's like, oh, I got all these famous people love me because I'm Elon Musk or whatever his real mm-hmm. name is or whatever his name is in a movie. I was no, like, oh. no, it was I think it was supposed to be more like um, Steve Jobs because you saw it in the end when he was <laughs> arguing with um, Andy. Yeah. He was wearing a black turtleneck and jeans. And I'm like, mm, that's a Steve <laughs> Jobs reference. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think what well, yeah, <laughs> they I think the they were trying to show how much he changes because even when he was at the bar with them, he was dressed up like Tom Cruise and Magnolia. Yeah. So I think you it, know, you know, actually I didn't get that. I got Matt Mercer and I was like, Why oh. are you doing Matt Mercer a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Matt. Yeah, Hugh Grant cameo, by the way. Oh, that I was, love that. That was a it blast. was amazing. I love really- that. And I also I also love the fact that like when he was in the island and um, Kate Hudson or like Birdie was like really coming on to him and he was like mm, I'm so uncomfortable because you don't <laughs> notice that I'm gay. Yeah. <laughs> His outfit on the island was the gayest thing in the entire movie. Yes, oh, it was perfect. The ascot. <laughs> the ascot, the ascot was perfect. I like. I want to get that uh, swim outfit he had with the stripes. I was like, I'm gonna buy that. <laughs> But yes, it was a blast. I I know they're making a third one. I'm really excited for that for sure. Yes, I am. I, Brian Johnson to keep making these movies. If he has, if he keeps out his ideas, I just want like it's just a fun, cozy Agatha Christie style like mystery mm-hmm. that like it it just hits a special spot that like not many not many stories can hit. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I agree. Just, like it was a blast. Yes. You were like you were not bored the entire time you were watching this movie. Same with uh, Knives was, Out. You were intrigued yeah, the entire time. Yeah. They're both very entertaining. They're both very funny. Yes. Janelle Monet did such a good performance in this one too. Yes. Mm-hmm. I do wish we got more Batista. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was cracking me up. Oh my god. I I just kind of like looked at him like oh you're playing that character why I know you're not that kind of guy but I, I love I love who he was playing a men's rights activist type of oh. alpha guy who's living in his mom's basement yes I love that it was like it was so funny and I love that the, like the mom knew everything oh, I which know. which which kind of like showed that it was supposed to showcase you know Edward Norton's character's stupidity yeah yeah. That he was dumb and uh, like he was dumb and he couldn't do it himself. Yeah. Or the um, what what is it the uh when the whole reveal at the end and uh Benoit Blanc's like this is dumb. And Bruce yes. Is so dumb it's genius. Nah, it's just plain it's just dumb. dumb. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so he solves the 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 murder mystery dinner like. Oh, that the- was so funny. That Just was the perfect. look, the look on Edward Norton, <laughs> like on Edward Norton's character's face, it, it was priceless. <laughs> yeah. It, like, and he just like looked at him, was like, "All oh, this effort gone into everything. I had Jillian Flynn write this. I'm like, you had Jillian Flynn? What the fuck?" <laughs> Oh, I love it. And even Benoit is like, yeah, she's a good writer. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, this was nothing. <laughs> was like... I love um, in the first movie, they have the reference to uh, Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Yes. Yeah. He's like, and like, well, what's Gravity's Rainbow? It's a book nobody's read. Yeah. Yeah. 
but I like the title. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, you know catch? I have a copy? I have a copy of Gravity's Rainbow. You I do? tried it once. I do. I read so. the first 100 pages. <laughs> um, I had to stop at the poop eating. Oh, um, <laughs> there's, there's a very graphic, detailed pe- chapter of, of poop eating. Makes um, sense. Which I, I heard he included it just to like gross people out because he wanted to like offend the people who give the book awards at the end of the year and he wanted to write this one scene to offend them all. <laughs> well, the book did make a cameo in Glass Onion. It did make a cameo in Glass Onion. Yeah, Serena Williams was reading it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about what the third movie is going to be about. I know. Uh, me that- too. Uh, I hopefully do like. They, hopefully, they will continue with the Eat the Rich thing because that is entertaining. <laughs> the joke that was going around Twitter for a little bit, which I'm fully on board with, is he? he it's him against the Muppets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's been talks in what uh, Ryan Johnson wants to do a Muppets Benoit Block mystery. <laughs> I actually would re- uh, watch the fuck out of that because it would be hilarious. Oh, <laughs> uh, that would be great. <laughs> but uh, but I think they should probably just make it like a little small episode in the Muppets, not yeah. a movie. Yeah, I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. Disney owns the Muppets, and and I don't know how yeah. much they like him after Star Wars. So who knows if yeah. he'll tie back up? But I think we should we should uh, visit these ghosts of We the Girls who did not make it. Gosh, yeah. By E. A. Uh, Petricone, which you can read on NightmareMagazine dot com. And yeah, this is this is a heavy. Every time I pick a story for Nightmare Magazine, it ends up being heavier than I expected it to be. Yeah. <laughs> I should have probably read it first before I said, let's do this story. But <laughs> I, I didn't read it first. So we all, we all went in on the same level. Hey, it's all right. It's actually a really good one. <laughs> it's a really good one, but it's, it's really fucking dark. It um, is. So this story is narrated by the Ghosts of Girls who were murdered by a man named Trevor. And, and no, Raleigh. And, and, and Raleigh. Raleigh. And Raleigh. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a duo team. Each yeah. of them are telling their story as Trevor and Raleigh have someone new they're bringing to the place where these girls were murdered. The 14th yeah. one. Yeah. Yes. Well, and it's set up really interesting because it's the first, it's, it, it's sort of long. I mean, Nightmare Magazine tells you how long it is. It's like 8,000 words, so I guess not super long. But the first, what, like 4,000 is mostly about the 13 girls. They each telling little bits of their story. You're not getting the full picture Mm -hmm. of it. And then it's like halfway through, that's when they get the new one locked in this, like, warehouse basement thing. Yeah. Which is, I, I, I like that idea because it kind of sets you up for what's happening and sets you up with who these girls are and what they are, what they dealt with and what they are trying to accomplish. And I think it's this, it, this story is interesting because it's them talking to us and mm-hmm. they're kind of calling us out <laughs> throughout the whole story. I, like, yeah. It, yeah, but it, it felt, um, Righteously deserved. Yes. Yes. Like we basically, as a reader, we had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I think I, which I, I liked because I, I like it does. It kind of gets you into that position and the really you get uncomfortable. Yeah. Real fast. Yes. Where, cause you are, you're reading it. And like I said, you're halfway through and you're kind of like, well, as a reader of horror and reading something in nightmare magazine, you're like, Oh, what's going to happen. I want to know what's going to happen. And they're like, mm-hmm. Of course you do. That's what you're only interested about is the, yep. the, it's the aftermath. Yeah, the aftermath, the the whatever horrible thing that's happening in here. And um, you're not you're not you're not interested in us. You just want to know the aftermath. You're always interested in them. And I was like, this is just every serial killer podcast and a documentary is ever <laughs> produced. Yeah. It like and it's funny because in we were talking about it before the show, and I'll bring it up here too because like, because not only did I and I haven't seen Black Phone or read Black Phone, but just from the mm-hmm. trailers, I at first I was like, oh, this is 
coming off a little bit like that. We're following ghosts and there's somebody trapped in here instead of kids. It's, it's women, it's girls. Um, it's not that, but what, I, but what's interesting is there's that a little bit. And then I kept thinking of Gwendolyn Keist's stories. She did a lot with different stories on like, we're so focused, you know, even when we did Re- reluctant immortals, mm-hmm. so focused on Dracula, so focused on Jane Eyre Mm-hmm. That we yeah. kind of forget these side characters and these things that happen to them. And mm-hmm. that this is kind of taking that and instead of going in that fantastical ro- realm of a fiction story, they're like more grounded and real. Like, yeah, this is stuff that happens. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but they like you do know what they're like. The women's professions was. Yes. I like yeah. that, it, like, throughout the whole thing, we get, and it, it we don't realize to the end, but you get, like, what all their favorite ca- colors were and why their favorite colors were. And then when you get to the end, I think it's, I can't remember which girl it is. I would have to flip through. Um, you find out that she she was the one that wanted all this information from. I think she might have been the 13th. or maybe No, she not. was the first. It was, she was the, first the first one. Yeah, yeah. Rachel. Because she was the one for the job. Yes, it was Rachel. Yeah. And, and it was so Rachel's. She- Sometimes thinks like, what if what if she got the job? Yeah, mm-hmm. wouldn't that be something? And I was just like this, especially this sentence. I was like, Jesus, this is awful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because uh, because um, you know this probably goes through a lot of people's minds when this is happening to them. Yeah, oh, yeah. I but- mean, what part I thought worked was uh with the colors is it says here. I feel which I feel which girl this is, but it says her favorite color is the red of life, even now after everything that was done to her. When she was young, her mother had to deliver her friend's baby in their kitchen. I was Rachel, and Rachel never forgot the the squalling, lifeful scene, the mm-hmm. red on her and the red on the baby's cheeks. Yeah. Yeah. So it it, it I like that we get that at the end because I think it it's doing what EA wants, which is giving us more to who these characters are, as opposed to, well, they were captured in a basement and murdered yeah. on top of being tortured. Like, yeah. This is basically us. Like it's a reprimand. Like we're being reprimanded for not wanting, like for not wanting to know the victims better. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and it just, it reminded me of, uh, because we've already talked about it in other episodes, like with, um, with the uh, Jeffrey Dahmer document, uh, uh, documentary, yeah. or like the, Je- the Jeffrey Dahmer film, you know, it was more. It was just basically focused on him, even though they like the producers that claimed that it was like, no, 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 we're talking about, we're like, we're we're putting the victims into light into this, and you're like, not really though, <laughs> like you're, it's still filmed in his point of view, and you are kind of like making it seem like his condition or like what he did wasn't as bad as it was supposed to be so no you're in the wrong here like yeah. you're not doing you're not delivering what you said you were going to do exactly. and and ea is delivering what she said she was going to do like she is telling us about the victims yeah which is really needed but at the same time and and and, and it's super sad yeah it, it is yeah. incredibly sad well, and and yeah, it's sad, and it, it what's interesting is just talking about that is you kind of get the setup for who Trevor. I mean, we don't know a lot about him, but we know what he looks like, and he looks. The, the one description is he's not the most attractive man in the bar, but mm-hmm. he's the nicest one in the bar, and all this stuff. So he's just kind of this normal, normal looking person. And they reference right from the start that for a long time he had a girl with him, Sandy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's how they could kind of l- lure. Some, lure uh, the women. Lure the women is because it was these two dudes and then this one girl with them. And she was always like, oh, come on, you know, it'd be fun. And, and, and they referenced right from the start, like, oh, well, we think that they're not murderers, but now we have to assume that they're always murderers because 
Yeah. This happened. Uh, yeah, because you 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 get like in the sense that she they also mentioned like you know if the if it had been just the two of them, just the, the Rolly and Trevor, we wouldn't have gone not at all. But because yeah. Sandy was there as well, it gave us a feeling of safety. Yeah. So. And and yeah, I mean, when I was reading, I was like, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't trust any of all, any people with this. Yeah, it's it's yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting because throughout all these stories you get, it's it's not. And David, she even references it at some point in here, how like it's all walks of life. It's mm -hmm. somebody who's addicted to math. It's somebody yeah. who's yeah. Um, uh, what like a social worker. And mm -hmm. it's somebody who's applying for all these jobs and, all. Yeah. you know, it's it, it's any it's kind of like basically what eventually drove them to those three was some kind of act of desperation. Yeah. Yeah. Which I understand, like, especially with the like the person who, you know, with the like Rachel with all the interviews, jobs and with um, the one with the meth, the, the meth addiction. And it's like you you understand that if someone were to lend you a hand, because in most situations, people wouldn't. Yeah. You kind of would grab onto it. Exactly. Which and and. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it, it just ends up horribly. Yeah. Yes. So it's. Yeah. But uh, but as you said, like like this is a heavy fucking read, and I'm not gonna. <laughs> I, I'm not joking. I I had to like step out and like go into the kitchen and just cry <laughs> at first because it was it it reminded me of uh, it reminded me of the butterfly garden. Oh yeah. Yeah. It had like this. It had the same heavy, heavy themes in it, uh, but it still had those also, uh, which I was grateful for. Like the end of the story, both with the butterfly garden and this one, is that like you have hope at the end. Yes. Uh, which is good because you need hope when you're dealing with this kind of heavy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> This yeah. is this is a dark story. Like it's not. It's really not for the faint of heart. And we read lots of extreme horror. Mm -hmm. Like we read lots of like really messed up stuff. But this is an emotionally like impactful story. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's yeah. It was it's, <laughs> it's, it's a good bad. one. <laughs> but yeah, like it go. Are we going to spoil territory now or? Yeah, sure, yeah. let's do it. I think we can. Yeah. It's a yes. short one. It's free. Read it. Nightmare Magazine. Um, yeah. it, also, I, the way, there's three sequels to uh, the, the Butterfly Fire. Garden. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I might need a, another year to, <laughs> to mentally prepare myself to, to go into that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, going into spoiled territory. So we mentioned like we mentioned the, like at the end, like. We are going through the lives of these 13 women who are, of course, not dead, because that's what the, is basically what we hear at the first sentence, basically. Uh, and then they they kind of sh like are witnessing the act of Trevor and Rolly bringing in the 14th one, Monica. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, at first they are kind of what they like the ghost kind of want her to join them because they know there is no escaping. Yeah, but like, at this, but at the same time, they're like some of them are still like, no, she is smart. She is trying to figure things out. She is trying to, you know, get Rolly to untie or unbuckle or unshackle her like ankle. Yeah, and there are times like yeah, in those moments, you were like my hope kind of soared a little bit when yeah. she like when she almost got him to talk. Yeah, almost got him to lean because he she happened to be the, the one who was uh, who was developing the video game that Rolly was playing. And but, you know, and I but the realist in me and also because I've I've listened to so many serial kill podcasts <laughs> and just so many true crime podcasts are just yeah, it's just it's a horrifying. You also like there was a part of me like, no, she's not going to it's not going to work. <laughs> she's she's gonna join them at, at one point or another 
Yeah. Uh, so it was also like it was like one part hopeful and one part depressing as fuck. Well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and she even like makes that reference because we see the scene with the video game talk and everything, and then the, the ghosts are like, "Well, we all tried to do something similar and it didn't work." Yeah. yeah exactly. It's like every like you know, at first you always tr- you're trying to do whatever you can, but then after a couple of days, you kind of the hope kind of fades away. Yeah. And well, it's just, a, oh, yeah. go on. No, 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 go on. Well, I was just going to say it's interesting, like leading up to, I think I know where you're going with it. It, you know, kind of flipping through, looking at this again, the way they set up Trevor and Raleigh and in, in, in this, how it kind of worked. Like with Rachel, you kind of get this idea of how nervous they were um, on doing this. But then when we're here with Monica, you see yeah. Trevor at a point like, oh, I'm going to make an appearance. I'm going to go to the places people will see me. Yeah. So that like- they don't. Yeah, no. they did. They did mention like they were sloppy with Rachel. Yeah. So, so yeah. It, it's horrifying to know that they've kind of finessed their techniques. Yeah, and even like it's just a- the setup of this place, like we get, it's some out of nowhere factory, abandoned factory warehouse thing, but the door is this really hard door to open mm-hmm. in the basement. Like you need people to help push it open and. And there's, there's a, a like a spade. Yeah, a spade. That I was helps I was keep... gonna say shovel, but then again, the girls corrected. And were <laughs> he- he- like, he- was it Heather? I think her name was Heather or Chelsea. She was like, nope, it's a spade. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because she was into gardening or or, or something like that. Yeah. So I was like, ah, in, in respect for that, it's it's a spade, people. <laughs> <laughs> for a, for a paragraph when you mentioned Rachel being the first victim and they were sloppy and the mm-hmm. one sentence that hit me that is when they just say people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about would call that lucky yeah yeah, yeah exactly this, that, that, the last sentence just makes it so much more impactful I know like she has a way with like I said like we've been saying like with the story like this is a gut punch to everyone who reads this. Yeah. Like yeah. every sentence is focused on you, uh, the reader. Yeah. It's like you well, are like if you don't feel things from this, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what's interesting before we get to the end um, is flipping through this and kind of like what we've been saying is the I way feelings matt that you're a monster because you had no feelings over the story is that the original <laughs> no i had feelings over that story <laughs> i'm not a total robot uh, <laughs> but uh, what's interesting it with this is it's like because it is when you talk about like the podcasts and the true crime documentaries and the movies and everything like that how it's kind of where that stuff is focused where she focuses this not only on the girls um but also just like this like setup process where it feels like the ghosts are telling us like here is like how they did it and here's who they are like here's who all of us are and everything like that kind of just showing because it is them i mean like one of the questions that she's sort of answering with this is that question of like you know how how did the girls get in this situation why didn't they get out or like how did they fall for this and you kind of like she's this is like like victim blaming yeah and Mm -hmm. exactly and she's answering all of this and showing Mm -hmm. and she's like talking about this factory this warehouse and like she even asks, like, you know, where did they find a door like that? Who owns the building? Who has time to lure murder, lure and murder women? And it's like, well, the, these people wanted it badly enough. They were going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And and so kind of taking away the sensationalism of mm-hmm. the event and, sh- and showing us, like, no, here's the mechanics of, like, what these two dudes are doing. 
Mm -hmm. And it's also like even because, uh, you know, we as horror readers and like true crime readers or serial killer readers or something like that, we usually tend to go for, you know, the vivid descriptions, for yeah. example. Yeah. But here in this, she's like, you know how this is done. I don't need to tell you this. Yeah. And and it's and I also I just like the tone that it's giving us. You're like you and it's kind of like it is shaming us. And I'm yeah. like, and I fully take the shame. Like I take I fully take responsibility. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this is not something we should enjoy reading or just anticipating, basically. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. I I appreciate the fact that she is like, <clears throat> we are not going to go into this in this story. We're going to focus on the ones that are left behind. Yeah. And I love that. Um, I don't know if you, uh, there's one, like there's this one cha YouTube channel that I listen to or watch from time to time. I recommend to people, I probably have mentioned it at some point in the podcast before. It's called Coffeehouse Crime. Okay. And it's a, it's basically he, he this guy, he just kind of documents any kind of true crime that has happened around the world. Uh, but the most refreshing thing about it is, is that he focuses on the victims. He he tell like he tells them their names, he like what they did, and then you know he goes goes with the crime, of course, and why and everything. But at the end, he always ends with it's horrible what happened to those people. We should never forget them. And um, just remember that. Yeah. And I yeah. find that really refreshing. Uh, I, because there because there are so many, like, I haven't, I'm I, thankfully, I haven't stumbled upon any of these podcasts, but, like, I've heard with a lot of true crime podcasts that there were just two women who were just laughing yeah. about how one yeah. person was brutally killed or something like that. And I'm like, this was a person, you guys. Right. Yeah, there was one that I, I stopped listening to because they were like, making jokes while talking about like the serial killer and I'm like this this isn't this isn't the vibe yeah that, like, I, I want to put out there in the world yeah um, I'd rather try to focus on the people who were affected by these horrible monsters yeah yeah exactly uh he actually he did take um take one of the murders that happened here in Iceland and uh, it happened I think now four or five years ago um I still haven't watched it because this is still really close to heart to us. It affected basically a lot of people here. That's only because you guys aren't used to murder. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. And, but still, I mean, this, and I, I appreciate that he kind of like, okay, this is really recent. So I'm going to go with this as best as I can with as much respect as I can. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I yeah. feel growing up in America, I don't know, maybe Matt has a perspective on it. We kind of become desensitized. I know. Yeah. To a lot of the stuff with, with what goes on in our country. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's because like this story maybe impacted me a little bit more. I don't know. Is that the reason, oh, Matt? Or? It, really, it simply impacted me. Like, I felt, I felt an extreme sense of guilt by the time I finished this story. Yeah. <laughs> Almost in a way that um, the same is the same, not as heavy as it did when I read uh, Girl Next Door. Girl, Girl Next Door is also another book that, like, yeah. the, the author is calling the reader out on their participation in this. Mm -hmm. And it makes you feel very guilty as, as the reader for reading the events of that book. And this kind of felt me, made me feel guilty in the same way. I didn't, like, cry, but no. I felt an extreme sense of dread and guilt on, mm -hmm. like, in myself when I when I came across this story. It's a great story, but it's gonna it's gonna put you through some feelings you gotta process. Oh yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I mean the event, the actual event is horrifying. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the hopeful thing about this story, yeah, is, is like as we're going through, like we are, you know, Monica is still trying to get free. 
And, you know, and it is, I actually really like the part about, you know, the ghosts, like they, they were saying like, oh, we're probably thinking that we gained some powers that yeah. we're just going to go there and we're going to help you a la black phone style, basically. Yeah. Uh, and they were like, no, we're dead. We're ghosts. We can't do <laughs> yeah. anything. <laughs> and it was like, oh, there goes that hope again. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, but I still, I, I like the realistic punch to it. Yes. Uh, but it like the, but it came like the rescue came uh, came in the form of, and I love that two other women. Yeah. Yeah. Who who because this is, and I'm speaking this as a woman. Uh, I don't know if guys have this, but this has been ingrained into us that we have this what we call intuition, and if we have the have a creepy vibe, we stick with it. Yeah. And um, th- and in the f- and it happens with these two women. The like one of the uh, the older one, she noticed something was really creepy with those two guys, yeah. who took who took Monica. And she decided instead of because a lot of like in this case, there's always the bystander effect. Instead of going through with that, she decided no, I'm gonna I'm, I need to investigate this. I need to see if she's gonna be okay. Yeah. Well, despite I, despite the fact that she, I think, what was she was she on uh, like going to an interview or something? I don't know. It was kind of weird. Yeah, they were like uh, probably going to some meeting or something like that. Yeah, and yeah. <clears throat> it's such a again like the way she's doing this, setting this up. It's the two women, the younger woman woman in the car, um, and we do get their names uh, near the end for yeah. people. Uh, the younger ones like the boss of the older one and like so we're we're kind of getting this very kind of just generic kind of setup of like oh it's just these two women on a business trip and they went to this warehouse and one of them can't get on the phone and she's like you know we got to get somewhere and they i what i love is that they leave and then they come back mm-hmm. yeah i thought that was like again going exactly what you said where the older one's like no something's wrong I'm going to go figure it out. You find service and call the police. Yeah. Because I understand the fact, like, especially with, with the younger one saying, this is like, she was basically saying like, this is our job on the line and we need to go. Yeah. And as a woman, I know how important that can be. You know, being a woman in the job market is fucking sucks. (laughs) Uh, So I completely understood her reasoning behind this um and i also love the fact that like the older one she you know she did like she wanted to continue but she hesitated and and as soon as she said like we need to go search up on a line i understood like yeah we like it was also this kind of like she's keeping on with with the theme of desperation yeah uh but i did love the fact that they came back yeah and yeah. I also, and I also love the fact that, you know, and this is like this is a trope, probably like in a lot of horror films. Like you, like when you're watching, for example, a slasher or something like that, and the main character, the final girl, is running around and she doesn't pick up any weapons on the way. <laughs> yeah. And EA dis- addresses this as well. Like she went through the kitchen and she didn't ca- she didn't grab a knife she didn't grab the uh, the leg brace she didn't bra- grab anything she just held on to these heels that she had yeah. so it, she didn't make any noise yeah. as she was yeah. going through the warehouse yeah. and I, I i just thought it was the most realistic thing ever it's like yeah because why would you why would you need to bring something like that you, this is you would think this but at the same time this is a realistic situation <laughs> <laughs> but she does grab the spade. She does. Indeed, yes. she does. Which I thought was a nice little setup in one of those moments where you're like, happy that she grabbed it. But then you're like, oh, crap, this is going to be trouble because this is the thing holding the door open. <laughs> yes, I yeah. love I love the fact that EA yeah, used the ghosts screaming that. Yes. Like the spade, the spade, because I had forgotten about it a little bit. Then I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. And well, like it was a ro- like EA managed to do like a huge roller coaster of emotion. Like, hey, hope, no dread, hope, no yeah. dread. <laughs> and then maybe hope at the very, very end. 
Yes, <laughs> it, like, it, it is ambiguous, but the ending yeah. is basically all of the three women, they are struggling to opening to open that huge steel door. And unbeknownst to, ne- to them, the ghosts suddenly are driven to help them out. Like they all put their hands on the steel door and push. Yeah. And that's basically how it ends. Like, and together we push. So you, you, you hope we yeah. don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> you hope for the best. But the I, best. Th- I think exactly. I think you, you leave with hope. Yeah. Like the story leaves you with hope. Yeah. Like I can be an incredibly cynical and a depressed person, but I, this left me with hope. Yeah. No, it's, I, so, yeah. It was a really good story. Yes. I can understand why the story won a Shirley Jackson award. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's, it's definitely worth checking out. I think you'll, for listeners, you'll be, I'll help you go be through a lot prepared. of emotions. Exactly. Just be prepared. This is heavy. Mentally prepare yourself and then put on something happy afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> One hundred percent. I did. I didn't do that. I decided to watch Bar Rescue for some reason. And I was like, "Yeah, I just I, I needed verbal abuse being screamed at another person." <laughs> That's exactly what yeah. I needed. This this one best novelette of the two thousand twenty one Shirley Jackson Awards. Huh. One hundred percent deserved. Like that novelette's interesting, but I really like uh, short fiction. It went to you'll understand when you're a mom someday, but Isabel J Kim. Mm-hmm. And then novel was My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones. Mm-hmm. And novella was Flowers for the Sea by Zen E. Rockland. Oh, nice. Very nice. Mm-hmm. I was just more interested in the number count that the 8,000 is novelette. It is. It's 7,500. Then it's a novelette. Huh. All right. Well, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Learn <laughs> something new. <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I I should know. I wrote a novelette yeah, last year. <laughs> I was really going with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, it, like if I get to seven thousand five hundred, I'm good. And I will say, I got I'm to ten thousand, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I'm very excited for Abyss this year. I think it's going to be a good year for us. And I'm excited for our audience to take this journey with us as we spread the abyss even bigger and bigger and bigger. But um, Until Bear, it swallows us whole. That's the plan. <laughs> that is the plan. Villa Bear, what's your contact information? Where can listeners get in touch with you? I'm, at, believe it or not, I'm still on Twitter. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Despite it, despite it being the hellscape that it is, uh, you can find me on Twitter on at Vitlemayas. And that. I am also on Twitter at Brandenburg DM. And you can follow me on Twitter at Rudy53088. And be sure to give Abyss a follow with added to staring. And this is Richard Gerlach saying keep staring. <laughs> <laughs>